Welcome to Washington Legal Foundation's media briefing program on the U.S. Supreme Court term. My name is Glenn Lamby, uh, the Foundation's Chief Counsel for Legal Studies. This is about the 32nd year we've been doing this program. This is one of the few times where we're perfectly on time just after the court term ended. We always run the risk of scheduling this and running into the court uh, issuing opinions. I'd prefer this be tomorrow to give the core of court reporters out there a break, but uh, we are going forward this afternoon to discuss cases uh, that WLF is most interested in and some of the trends that we're seeing in the court. This term, Washington Legal Foundation was involved in seven merits cases. We supported the winning side in four of those. Uh, we lost one of those and two sort of pushed the Microsoft case and the Lighthouse case, both of which were taken off the calendar and or settled. Uh, we have three briefs uh, supporting cert in pending cert petitions before the court that may be decided on soon, and we also supported cert petitions in two cases granted for the next term, the Weyerhaeuser case and Apple versus Pepper. I'm going to introduce our speakers in the order in which they'll give their presentations, and then uh, we will have questions from the in-person audience. If you have questions online, there is a Q&A <coughs> box next to the viewing box on the website that you can type your questions into. I will relay those questions to the speakers as they come in. Leading off today is Michael Carvin, who's a partner in the Washington, D.C. office of Jones Day and proudly uh, to us, a member of our Legal Policy Advisory Board, has been so for quite a long time. In his 35 years at Justice Department and in private practice, Mr. Carvin has established himself as one of the leading appellate and trial lawyers uh, challenging state and federal regulations on constitutional and statutory grounds with 10 Supreme Court arguments and numerous high-profile victories. Following him will be Melissa Sherry, who's Deputy Managing Partner of the Washington, D.C. Office of Latham & Watkins, where she is also a member of the firm's Supreme Court and appellate practice. She returned to the firm in October 2014 after having served five years as assistant to the Solicitor General of the United States. She's argued 10 cases before the justices. She also, uh, before she joined the firm, she was a law clerk to Justice John Paul Stevens and Judge Diana Gribben Motz of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. Finishing up today will be Matthew McGill, who's a partner in the D.C. office of Gibson, Dunn & Crutcher, where he practices in the firm's litigation department and its appellate and constitutional law and intellectual property practice groups. He's participated in 21 cases before the court, including representing the successful petitioner this term in Murphy, or if you prefer, Christie, versus NCAA. He clerked for Judge Joseph McLaughlin of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the, D for the Second Circuit, and Judge John Roberts of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit before he was named the Chief Justice. Mike, if you could get us started. Great, thank you. I was telling Glenn that I'm not as prepared as I should be because I was going to prepare this morning and all I keep doing is rereading the Janus decision that came down this morning. Two years ago I'd argued the Friedrich case which made essentially the same uh, pitch as petitioners and unfortunately Justice Scalia died before uh, the court uh, struck down the Abood regime as you undoubtedly know. This from now on it means that agency fees from non-union members can't be charged to support collective bargaining or any other uh, activity of unions, which I think is a very important First Amendment decision will obviously have some uh, serious uh, political ramifications as well. There was other important cases this term, the travel ban most obviously. I think that was more important in terms of if it had gone the other way, you would have seen a real change in the relationship between the executive branch and the judiciary. Uh, the fact that they upheld it really, I think, just tells you that President Trump is entitled to the same deference as other chief executives. And there was the decision Wayfair in terms of overturning uh, this physical presence rule uh, in terms of whether or not the dormant commerce clause applies and whether states can tax uh, internet transactions. Um, but I think the other big theme of the court is that they did punt on a lot of the issues that people are interested in, most obviously the Kate case involving same-sex marriage. Uh, the decision basically said this cake, this person, this transaction was no good, but really didn't get into either the free speech or, or freedom of religion uh, decisions in other contexts. Also, of course, this is an area that I practice a lot, and we were waiting with bated breath on what the court was going to do with whether or not they could finally come up with a standard for distinguishing between unconstitutional political gerrymanders and acceptable use of politics in redistricting. In both the uh, Wisconsin and the Maryland case, they essentially punted on that, although I will say that because they found that there was no standing uh, for the 
Wisconsin plaintiffs to bring the political gerrymandering claim. That said, I do think, frankly, the Chief Justice very subtly put a very difficult burden for uh, plaintiffs who are trying to bring these kinds of cases, although he did it under the standing rubric. In the standing point he made, look, this involves individual right to vote. It doesn't involve collective interest in terms of how many representatives you have in the legislature. Well, if that's true, then it's hard for me to understand how anybody can bring a meritorious claim on the merits that, that uh, the state is engaged in egregious gerrymandering. Because at some level, the argument always is, we have 60% of the votes if the Democrats are the ones being gerrymandered, but we're only getting 45 to 50% of the seats. So it's always a relationship between how much representation we have in the legislature, which really doesn't make much difference at the district level. If you have to focus on the district, articulating a cognizable harm is, is virtually impossible uh, because, um, for example, the classic gerrymandering technique is to pack all the Democrats, if you're a Republican gerrymander, into the district. Well, at a district level, that, of course, doesn't disadvantage a Democratic voter. He's guaranteed to have his uh, chosen representative elected. It's only when you look beyond the ripple effect of that district in terms of adjacent districts that you can argue uh, that people are harmed. And so, in, in addition to that, um, the court had already rejected proportional representation as some kind of standard for a cognizable statewide harm. In response to that, uh, people came back and said, well, it's not so much proportional representation. We just want to maintain, maintain symmetry between the Republicans and the Democrats. If the Republicans get 60% of the seats with 50% of the votes, we want to make sure that the Democrats also get 60% of the seats with 50% of the votes. Um, in uh, the Wisconsin decision, the, the court, I think Justice Roberts, pulled the juiciest quote saying that's really not a cognizable standard. And he put this whole efficiency gap theory that they had been propounding in Wisconsin into that category. So again, I know I'm getting into the weeds, but the point is, in the guise of doing a relatively straightforward injury and fact standing analysis, I think the Chief Justice made it very tough for anybody to mount uh, a credible claim. We'll figure out where Justice Kennedy is going to be on this uh, in the future. I would note that these are all direct appeals. So if they either articulate a standard or don't articulate a standard, there's going to be at least 50 cases, direct appeals to the Supreme Court in 2022 as the lower courts try and straighten this all out. I'm hoping that will have an interim effect on the courts, so they'll just say, why don't we stay out of this area. Uh, other cases where they sort of punted, this is, again, more for nerds than anybody else, but. I've, this Marx v. U.S. concept of do you look at a concurring opinion's narrow holding as the law, of the, if it's a 414 decision, do you look at the one as, as being the uh, expounding what the law is, and the court took this and was going to straighten this all out, and then they took the case and said, well, we don't really have to decide it because we have five votes, so they punted on that. Uh, there's also involved in whether or not if you're uh, arresting uh, somebody in retaliation for exercising their First Amendment rights, whether or not um, probable cause to arrest them excuses the officer from any liability, even if he had engaged in First Amendment retaliation. That came up in this case called Lozman. And again, they issued a decision saying, in this context, in this particular case, it was no good, but we won't answer anything else. And I think that was sort of a theme of the court, that they were not taking a whole lot of cases, and the cases they did were not really resolving the broader legal questions. They were very fact-specific in their analysis, which for protect practitioners is not particularly helpful, but it may be a function of the fact that they were trying to punt maybe some of these controversial ones to see if Justice Kennedy remained on the court, or they just couldn't achieve a, a five-member majority and therefore went off on these very narrow fact-bound grounds. The final one, which WLF has asked me to talk about, which was also relatively narrow in an area that, again, I'm very interested in, separation of powers. There was this Lucia versus SEC case, and the issue was whether ALJs at the SEC are officers and therefore need to be appointed under the Appointments Clause by the head of the departments, which they are not at the SEC. And again, um, the court did answer that question. Justice Kagan wrote it, which to me is a very positive sign that at least in some circumstances she believes in separation of powers and accountability. The notion to me that an ALJ is not an officer of the United States that needs to, when I 
make it clear, it doesn't mean they need to be confirmed by the Senate. They just need to be named by somebody who's been confirmed by the Senate ahead of the department. The notion that they are exercising this extraordinary powers and don't even constitute officers was completely untrue. That said, the opinion itself was relatively narrow because it followed this prior Fry tag opinion, which involved tax court judges and didn't give you any kind of broader definition for what constituted an officer. So again, it's going to lead, which is good for me, bad for the country, a lot more litigation to be able to challenge agency decisions. It's not clear how this would apply outside of if you're not a judge, if you're some executive branch official who's in the enforcement area, whether it would apply to you. They didn't even say with respect to ALJs at the SEC whether or not the SEC could, quote, ratify the prior appointments and somehow retroactively bless these unconstitutional appointments. And this is a relatively complicated point, but uh, in the case, actually, I argued this Free Enterprise Foundation case. There's also this what we call the double for cause removal provision. If the SEC, which is only removable by cause by the president, then uh, itself designates somebody to be a subordinate, and that person is also only removable for cause, that was struck down in this Free Enterprise Foundation case. And so even if the ALJ appointments at the SEC or any other independent agency like the FCC uh, is upheld, the, this will lead to a number of challenges for anybody who's adversely affected by those ALJs because they'll argue that the double removal, for cause removal, renders their uh, uh, exercise of jurisdiction unlawful. The SG tried to get the court to reach this issue, but they, they affirmatively refused. Um, the only other points I think that I'll make generally is, again, uh, Glenn asked me to talk about uh, Justice Gorsuch, who's obviously uh, new to the court. Um, I think he's, from my originalist, textualist perspective, been behaving very admirably. I think he's a genuine originalist. I think he's a genuine textualist. I went through the exercise of trying to think of a vote that he cast in his tenure on the court that would have differed from Justice Scalia's, and I can't think of one. I think he faithfully follows the same kind of uh, methodological analysis. Um, he wrote the Epic case, which is a very important uh, Arbitration Act uh, case. Um, a, he wrote a very, I thought, excellent opinion, but also the fact that the Chief Justice had assigned him this important five to four decision, I think shows that uh, he's got the confidence of, of the Chief and, and the other Justices. Uh, textualism, I could give you a number of examples, but there was this uh, case Wisconsin Central that involved money remuneration and whether that was taxable and uh, stock options and he just basically made the point it says money in the statute stock options are not money the fact that they are close to money is, is not close enough and that was over a, a relatively vigorous dissent in terms of changing the court changing the courts I think he's also sent some signals that like Justice Thomas he's very willing to revisit uh, precedent and, and return to originalism. Uh, in the Texas case this week, he joined Justice Thomas's dissent saying that the Voting Rights Act doesn't even apply to redistricting, which would be a sea change in the law. So he's willing to go there. Um, he's also indicated in this Wayfair case that he thinks the whole Dormant Commerce Clause jurisprudence that Justice Thomas has been quite critical of is, is something that uh, he shares as well. In a case that Jones Day brought that nobody paid any attention to, with good reason, uh, he, he was a sole dissenter in Zveen, which involved the contract clause and very boring issues about life insurance policies. But um, probably no provision of the Constitution has been treated more unfairly or with less respect by the court than the contract clause. Uh, I'm not saying this was an easy case, but he was a sole dissenter there who was buying a contract clause argument that even Justice Thomas wasn't buying, which shows, I think, his, uh, again, devotion to originalism. Uh, other things that the press comments on about Justice uh, Gorsuch, he uses a lot of contractions. That may or may not be everybody's cup of tea, but I think he's actually a very clear writer and cuts to, cuts to the chase. I think his demeanor and argument, I think he's calmed down somewhat and uh, is obviously asking very uh, penetrating questions and he's been a valuable addition to the court. Uh, the final question is that I've been asked by WLF is, what kind of cases should the court be taking that they're not taking now? And my short answer is, they seem to be obsessed with sort of what I call the cert pool memo, check a box. Is there a split on some incredibly inconsequential ERISA case? We'll always take that. But they ignore, I think, the elephants in the room, 
which is they won't take uh, under the notion that this would be error correction, uh, state courts that are behaving very badly. It, in, I had a case for the tobacco industry where uh, the Florida Supreme Court basically has literally suspended all due process rights for tobacco companies and when they're being sued by ex-smokers. Uh, and of course you can't get a split in the circuits if it's one state court that has completely subverted the Constitution. There's a number of other examples I could give you from California where state courts have really run roughshod over basic uh, important constitutional uh, provisions and the court seems to stay away from those cases. Uh, my own view is that uh, these cases affect a lot more litigants, have a lot more importance in terms of the foundation of the law than these very narrow splits on, on important questions. And since the court's not really overburdened these days, it should really reach out and do error correction if the error is really obvious and it really affects a lot of people. So that would be my, my main complaint about the court. But other than that, I'll sit down and answer your questions later. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Hi, thank you for, for having me here. I'm going to try to cover three topics. Um, I'm going to start by just a few observations about this court's term. I'm going to talk a fair amount about the Solicitor General's office and how the government fared this term. Um, and then to the extent there's time, I'll talk a f about a few of the civil litigation cases uh, that were on the docket and were decided this term. Um, so starting off, one of the things I, I found myself focusing on getting ready for this were the 5-4 uh, decisions of the term. And uh, you know we've had a few in, in recent days, so I've been trying to update my numbers as, as I'm getting ready, uh, including this morning. Um, so what is interesting is there were, there were 19 5-4 decisions this term. Uh, the, the SCOTUS, you know, stat pack had the percentage at 23%, but I think that was before the last four 5-4 decisions, so that's going to go up pretty considerably. That is a much higher number uh, than the last two terms. The last two were 10% and 5% respectively. Um, going over the last, you know, eight or nine, ten years, I think the highest was in 2011, and that was 29%. Uh, I went into law because I don't do math, so I'm not sure adding these four whether we're going to top the 29%, but it seems like we're going to be uh, very close, if not if not above it. So that was a pretty significant shift um, this term. What was also really significant is the type of 5-4 lineups that we saw this term, and maybe just as importantly, the 5-4 lineups that we did not see. Uh, of the 19 5-4 decisions, Zero of them involved Justice Kennedy siding with what people have called, you know, the liberal bloc of the court. I, I personally don't like that term or characterization on, on either side, but it is an easy shorthand. And so by that, I mean Justice Ginsburg, Justice Kagan, Justice Sotomayor, uh, and Justice Breyer. So there, there were no decisions where Justice Kennedy um, sided with them. And, and, you know, I haven't gone back enough, but I imagine that is probably uh, either unheard of in recent years or, or at le the very least very, very rare to see that. On the flip side, there were, there were 14 decisions where Justice Kennedy sided with the so-called conservative block of the court. Um, and there were a couple interesting lineups as well. So there were, there were other divides. Just, uh, Chief Justice Roberts sided um, with the liberals uh, two times, and this was in Artis. Uh, and Carpenter and Justice Gorsuch sided uh, with them in a case called uh, Demaya, an immigration um, case that was heard last term and was reargued this term about whether uh, the definition of, I think it's aggravated felony in the immigration uh, guidelines is unconstitutionally vague. Two other cases had just completely different lineups. I don't know if they've ever existed before. One was the Wayfair case that, that was mentioned earlier. Uh, and that lineup was Justice Ginsburg, Justice Kennedy, Justice Alito, Justice Thomas, and Justice Gorsuch uh, in the majority. And then this morning, uh, the Florida v. Georgia decision that was decided involved Justice Breyer, the Chief Justice, Justice Kennedy, Justice Ginsburg, and Justice Sotomayor. So I'm sure um, someone will, will go through prior decisions to see if those lineups have ever existed before. Uh, they're certainly not what we normally see. The other thing I was just sort of noting looking back at the term is, you know, the storyline I think at the end of each term has been, you know, Justice Kennedy is, is in charge, he's in control, and he is sort of the deciding vote in a lot of these 5-4 decisions. Uh, and that, you know, may well still be true, but what was interesting to see is that at least as of two days ago, and I think the lineups probably haven't changed the stat, Chief Justice Roberts actually was in the majority slightly more. 
think it's one percent more than, than Justice Kennedy. So I think you know maybe the storyline this term uh, is that you know the the chief seems to um, be a in critically important vote in these cases at least as much. Uh, as Justice Kennedy, just or at least has been successful. Maybe that's the better uh, way to say it. In in these cases, um, this term he said a pretty high success rate. I think it was about ninety two percent of the cases he was in the majority. So the other thing I wanted to to spend some time talking about was the government in the Supreme Court and how the Solicitor General's office um, has fared. They participated um, a lot this term, as they do every term. They were in forty six of the 63 cases that were argued on the merits. Um, they argued uh, they were a party in 24 of those cases. They were amicus in 22. That's about how, uh, how it's been in prior terms. There's nothing to me significant about that number. Um, similarly, they, you know, the court has called for the views of the SG, CVSG in a large, uh, in a decent number of cases. This term, I think the SG's office responded to about 16 of those invitations. There's 13 that are still pending that presumably we will see at the beginning of, of next term. Um, and of the 16, they told the court to grant five of the 16 cases. That's also about where the SG's office usually lands. It is much more likely to get a deny recommendation out of a CVSG than it is to get a grant recommendation. Um, but the court agreed with the SG's office 15 of the 16 times. I think uh, the NCAA case is, is the one exception uh, to that rule. And I think the numbers were much like that maybe last term, but, but to me that, that's high. That's a pretty significant success rate. The court tends to agree with the SG's office when they recommend a grant they're less likely to do so when the SG's office recommends a deny, particularly when they write briefs that basically say, yeah, we think the lower court got it wrong, but you should deny for these other reasons, which happens a fair amount of the time. Um, but at least this term, um, even in the deny cases, in all but one, the court agreed with the SG's office and actually denied. So it goes to show how important those invitation briefs um, can be. As far as success, you know, how, how well did they do in the court? In terms of following the SG's office recommendations, we just talked about the CVSG's. Um, as far as government petitions go, they were a petitioner in five, uh, petitioners rather, in five cases. There was the Garza decision um, that came out of the, the DC circuit where the court vacated the lower court decision. So you can kind of count that as a successful uh, petition in, in some ways, um, even though the court didn't reach or decide the sanctions issue. Um, the only, there, there were a couple denials of government petitions, but most of them were, were either hold petitions, there was a petition uh, in the DACA case for cert before judgment, that's a pretty extraordinary kind of petition and the court didn't take that up. There was really only one petition that, that was just a regular cert petition that the court denied from the government and involved the definition of sexual abuse of a minor in one of the many statutes that, that looks to uh, prior convictions to decide what a correct sentence should be. And so that's also a pretty good success rate and also in keeping with prior years, um, unlike private parties, the government is, is, has a very detailed process and is pretty careful about when it asks the court to grant review. Uh, they view their credibility as being very important and so there, um, th there are many fewer government petitions uh, each year than there potentially could be. So if you compare decisions in which the government has lost in the Court of Appeals and the number of petitions you see, there's, there's a pretty big divide there which I think contributes to their, their high success rate. As far as, you know, when did they lose, uh, when was the case granted over their op? They were, they were respondents in 18 cases. That's also, I think, fairly um, par for the course. There's a, there's a lot of uh, oppositions filed. I didn't try to count how many. I just know from my time in the office that is probably one of the larger parts of the jobs was filing a large number of, of briefs in opposition. So my guess is if you figured out what the denominator was, that, that's a pretty good rate as well. Turning to the merits, how did they do? as far as cases that were argued before the court. So in the cases where they were a party, uh, and this is as of, I believe, yesterday, so it's probably missing the two cases this morning, but basically they were successful only about 50% of the time. Um, that's a low number. There was um, a sort of statistical report done, I think it was last year, uh, looking back at the Obama administration and looking back at prior administrations to see how the government had fared before the court. And the storyline, and there were a lot of articles written about it, was that the Obama administration had done pretty poorly before the court. And I think the, the stat was overall 50.5%. So this is somewhat in line with, with that 
uh, percentage. In prior administrations, it had kind of started to like go downhill after uh, the Reagan administration, according to this article. So if you look back and, and see what the stats are, it ends up being, let me see if I can get this right, 75% with the Reagan administration, then 70% uh, with the Bush administration, 63% with the Clinton administration, 60% with George W. Bush, and then moving on to the Obama administration. So there had been sort of a steady decline in success rates uh, by the government more generally. And so this kind of seems to follow that trend, at least. I think there's another story there, and I, I'll go to that in, in a moment. Um, if you look at the party cases, for example, like I said, the um, there were respondents in, in 18 of the cases. So there were... Uh, 24 cases where they were, a part, they were a party and they were a respondent in the large majority of them. Respondents don't win very often before the Supreme Court as a general matter. I think the stat usually is somewhere in the 70% range. Uh, and so, you know, they lost as respondent, probably in line with that stat, maybe even a little better uh, than, than that statistic. And so I think that skews the, the average quite, quite a bit. Uh, as far as amicus, when they participated as amicus, they were, uh, had a 70% success rate. And so overall, if you take the party stats and the amicus stats, they were somewhere around 59, 60 uh, percent in terms of success. And so, you know, looking back, like I said, it sort of follows the trend of the government not faring as well before the court, but, but kind of like there were, there were articles about the Obama administration sort of looking underneath the numbers, I think it's important to do that here as well. And when you separate out sort of the overall percentage and you look more closely at what the big cases were for the administration this term and what the um, big cases were for the court this term, it tells a little bit of a different story. And so, you know, they were, they were the government was a party in, in four of, you know, I, you can, uh, I guess, debate what is a big case, but what I would call uh, the big cases this term. And they, they did pretty well in those. So uh, in Epic Systems, which was mentioned briefly about class arbitration provisions, this is a case in which the government switched its position uh, where the Solicitor General's office was on one side and the NLRB was on the other side. And they won. It was a big case that they won based on their new position. Uh, in in Lu Lucia, am I pronouncing it? Lucia. Um, uh, uh, that's another case in which the government switched its position um, about the, the ALJs, the SEC ALJs, and that's another case in which they switched a position and won. Uh, and then the, the tra travel ban case that just came down was obviously a big party win for them. So, and that, so the only remaining case where they were a big case in a party was Carpenter. So that would, I would probably say, is one of the biggest losses for the government. This year, this is a Fourth Amendment case about whether you need a warrant to search cell sites. It reminds me always, whenever I think of it, if you've seen the serial podcast, um, that's sort of my short form of describing that particular case and, you know, obviously oversimplifying it a bit. Um, but that was one of the cases in which the government lost. That was also one of the lineups where it was the Chief Justice um, along with the more liberal members of the court. Beyond the party cases for the, the big amici cases, um, they lost some, but they, they won a lot more than, than they lost. So Janice that came down this morning, the union's fee case, it's another example of a change of position where, where they were successful uh, in, in Houston, which is about um, the Ohio address verification process under the National Voters Relation, uh, the, the NVRA, another case in where they're amicus, another case where they changed a longstanding position, and another case in which they were successful. Um, in Wayfair, they argued that the court should overrule rule Quill. They won that one. Uh, in Masterpiece, you know, it was uh, a bit of a punt, but they did mostly um, win, I would say, on that case. Oh, sorry, they, they did win that case. And then Abbott is the one I was going to say is a, you know, a case in which they mostly won. Their position largely prevailed. And same with NIFLA, which, which I think we'll talk about a bit later. But NIFLA was a First Amendment uh, case that was recently decided, I believe, yesterday. And that's one in which they, they did a little bit of a split the baby position, but for the most part, they were successful. Uh, the two, you know, exceptions, I think, to, to that rule with them as amicus were, were Jesner, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Jesner was a case about the alien tort statute and whether corporations can be liable under the alien tort statute. Uh, they were, they stuck with their prior position, and I'll elaborate on that, and they lost that one. And then the NCAA case, um, which again, we'll talk about more, uh, is one in which they, they took a position and were unsuccessful. So I think, you know, overall, that 
when you look at the bigger cases, even if you you know take the fifty percent number, they had a very good term uh, before before the court. And as I kind of mentioned in going through, there were cases in which they changed their position, and there's been a lot of press about their changes of position. It's something that the SG's office does not do lightly. Uh, there is a really high bar for changing the position, but it does happen. It has happened in the past, um, and it happened several times this term. There were arguments in which it came up, and Justice Sotomayor asked, you know, how many times have you changed position now? So there's, there's four main cases, I think, where they have changed their position or did change their position. There's Epic, there's Lucia, Janice, and Husted, and in each of those cases, they won. So they're 4-0 they're oh for cases where they changed position. Jesner is a case in which um, the, during the Obama administration, the same issue came up in a case called Kiobel. And in that case, the government filed an amicus brief, full disclosure, I was on the brief, um, saying that you know, corporations can be held liable under the ATS. Uh, the, the court didn't end up deciding it then. It decided a different issue. It came back up in this Jesner case, different administration. They stuck with their position. They filed a brief saying the same thing that they had said previously, and, and they lost this time. So you know, take what you want from that. Um, whether they should have changed positions or not, they were successful in, in doing so. So that's you know pretty much I think what I was gonna say about how the SG's office fared this term, how the government fared. Just want to spend if I have a little more time on a, a few civil litigation cases this term. One um, thing I notice, and this is sort of a continuing trend, uh, and that we you know we said I would talk about, which is that. Uh, Justice Ginsburg had an another term in which she spent a good number of her opinions writing about time limits. Um, she writes a lot in areas of civil procedure. It's what her background is in, is what she's really interested in. And I'm guessing that um, not too many of the justices are fighting her to get those particular <laughs> decisions. So she kind of has her stamp on all of them. There were three, at least three, um, this term. She wrote uh, China Agritech versus Resh, uh, Resh or um, which was about American pipe tolling and what happens when you file a class action, the court denies certification. American pipe tolling means the time limit will be told and you can go ahead and file your own lawsuit or you can intervene as an individual with respect to that lawsuit. And the question here was whether you could instead just file your own class action after the fact and not worry about the limitations period. And, and the answer uh, was no, you can't do that. Um, and you know, Justice Ginsburg wrote that decision. She also wrote Artis, which was about um, supplemental jurisdiction. There's a tolling provision when you file in federal court. You have federal claims, you have state claims. If the court ultimately dismisses the federal claims, a lot of times they will then use their discretion to get rid of the state claims as well. And there is a provision that says that the time limit will be tolled while that is pending, plus you get 30 days, and the debate was whether once the dismissal happens, you only have 30 days. Is it a grace period to go back to state court, or does tolling really mean the time period stops? So you have whatever left time is left on the limitations period plus 30 days. Uh, the answer was the latter, and that was another Justice Ginsburg decision. And then final final one, which I think was the the fastest decision of the term, uh, was Hammer, where the question was, um, there is a, a, you know, a statute governing when you have to file an appeal, but there's also a federal rule saying when extensions can be granted and what those extensions can look like. And the question is whether that rule was jurisdictional or not. Uh, the answer in keeping with the trend in recent years was no. It's not jurisdictional. Federal rules can't be jurisdictional in that sense. That was a very quick decision, and it was another Justice Ginsburg um, decision on that. There were other big civil litigation cases this term. I won't spend that much time on them, but just to kind of quickly walk through them. One was the, the Jesner case, which I've already talked about some. It's the Alien Tort Statute case. Um, and what happened there is the court kind of continued its trend of cutting back on instances where you could bring claims under the Alien Tort Statute. It's a, become, in the last 30, 40 years or so, a very um, a, a statute that a lot of uh, human rights organizations rely on to bring very large uh, cases based on oftentimes events that occurred overseas. The court um, years ago in Sosa started cutting back on it a little bit, then it didn't touch it for a very long time. In Kiobel, the court took a case to decide whether corporations can be liable under it, 
They ultimately had re-argument to talk about extraterritoriality, and they cut back on it significantly at that point, limiting when you can bring claims based on actions overseas. They've taken, they took Jesner this term, and they ultimately decided that foreign corporations cannot be liable um, under the ATS. And so they continue to sort of slowly cut back on it. They still have left open, it seems, the question with respect to domestic corporations, and that presumably will be the next case that we see because the other trend in recent years, at least, is it's the Supreme Court cutting back on the ATS, not the courts of appeals. Um, up until the court took a Kiobel, it was kind of getting larger and larger and larger, and now it's heading in the other direction. And so I, I, I suspect we may see another um, iteration of this in the not too distant future, but, um, but for now the trend continues. There was also uh, the Cyan case, um, which there's not all that much to say about that. That was a case about SLUSA, uh, uh, the securities litigation uniform. I don't even know the last two letters. I know it is SLUSA. Um, but it, it's about when you can sue in state court for securities law violations versus when you're limited to federal court. And what the court uh, said in an opinion by Justice Kagan is um, you can't, when, it, when it's only a claim under the 1933 Act, you can sue in state court. And then the second question was, okay, if you can sue in state court, can you remove it to federal court? And the answer to that question was no. The government had taken a middle of the road position saying, yeah, you can sue in state court, but you should be able to remove. The court rejected that position as well. And it's a decision that kind of just says, you know, listen, this is what we think the text says. We think the history supports it. Maybe it's not the um, most obvious way to make sense of the securities laws in terms of what Congress intended and what you're bringing in federal and state court. But we can make sense of it enough, and we're just going to run with, the, with what we think the statute actually says on this one. And then finally, and, and importantly, is the Epic Systems uh, decision. This was a very big decision involving arbitration and the NLRA. It involved um, whether in employment contracts you can have arbitration provisions that effectively prevent employees from bringing class actions because it, it limits them to arbitration and often limits them to individual arbitration rather than class arbitration. Um, and this was an interesting case from the very beginning. There were a number of petitions on the same issue. Uh, one of them was from the government. Um, and the court granted the case. NLRB ended up on one side. The SG's office ended up on the other side. Uh, and ultimately, the court continued to follow its trend to say arbitration wins in these, in these circumstances. Um, there's a lot more to it. You could probably spend an entire hour talking about the case, so I, I won't go further down that road, um, except to say that it continues the trend, the pro-arbitration trend that we've seen in recent years. And the court for next term has granted another arbitration case. It's the new prime case um, that basically asks, the, asks two questions. One is, who gets to decide whether an exception in the Federal Arbitration Act applies? Is, is it the court or is it the arbitrator? And then the second question is, well, what exactly does that exception mean? And you know, if history is any indication, uh, it seems like the pro-arbitration side um, maybe has some supporters on the court. Uh, and at least in, in Epic, Epic Systems involved, among other things, a savings clause in the FAA that the court read narrowly. This one involves an exception in the FAA. And I think there's you know, a question of whether a similar type of reasoning might apply for the court to read that exception narrowly as well. But we'll see that next term. Thanks. Thank you. Matt? Thanks, Glenn, and thanks to the Washington Legal Foundation for having me here today. Um, so the, the panel is entitled How Free Enterprise Fared at the Supreme Court. So I'm going to touch on four cases that I think uh, that really, four or five cases that most impacted free enterprise. And if we're going to talk about those cases, I think you have to start with the decision that is leading to the creation of a new industry here in this country, which is the case formerly known as Christie versus NCAA, now known as Murphy versus NCAA, also known as the sports betting case. Uh, this case is, uh, despite what you might have read it in ESPN or, or other uh, mainstream media outlets, it's not really about the legality of sports betting per se but rather whether the federal government could control the way in which states regulate sports betting. And the answer that the Supreme Court gave to that question was a resounding no. 
uh, that the federal government was free to regulate sports betting if it wished, and it could even prohibit sports betting outright, but it could not make states implement the federal government's chosen policy of banning sports betting via state law. Um, this was, uh, this is also known, uh, this was an implementation uh, of what is known as the anti-commandeering principle. That case, uh, that, that principle has deep roots, but actually prior to the, uh, the Murphy decision, there had only been two other cases uh, that had struck down federal statutes on anti-commandeering grounds. The first was in 1992 called New York versus United States. That was a decision authored by Justice O'Connor. Um, and the second, just five years later, was Prince versus United States. Uh, and that was a decision of Justice Scalia. Um, and that was a 5-4 case, uh, hotly, hotly contested. Um, that case involved the, uh, the Brady Bill, uh, which required chief, uh, local law enforcement officials to, pro to implement federal background checks. And in that case, the Supreme Court said the Congress could not require state officials to do the federal government's bidding and perform these background checks. Well, similarly here, Congress could not require the state of New Jersey to ban sports betting uh, at Congress's behest. Um, this was a sweet vindication for those of us who uh, had litigated uh, this case for some six years. When we first uh, made this argument in the district court in New Jersey, arguing that the, that the federal statute at issue violated the anti-commandeering doctrine, the district judge looked at us like we had foil hats on our head. Uh, you know, the, it, this was a really obscure constitutional principle, and he quickly uh, dismissed our argument. When we finally got this case to the en banc Third Circuit, we, we lost there nine to three, and only one of the 12 judges actually found that the federal statute uh, had, done, had engaged in impermissible commandeering. Um, but when we finally got to the Supreme Court, it was actually the vote was seven to two on the question of whether the, the federal statute impermissibly commandeered. Uh, for the, the five typical, typically known as conservative justices, but also Justice Kagan and Justice Breyer uh, join, joined the holding that, that PASPA, this statute, the Professional Amateur Sports Protection Act, impermissibly commandeered New Jersey's regulatory authority. Um, Justice Breyer's vote in, a, in particular was a great surprise. He had authored a dissenting, a dissenting opinion in Prince. Um, Justice Kagan, no one had much reason to expect, would, uh, would join the conservatives in a, in a federalism case such as this one. Uh, and I think that turns out to be you know, quite important because it, the, the fact that Justice Kagan and Justice Breyer now have joined this anti-commandeering case really cements the anti-commandeering principle as a, as a vital and effective principle of constitutional law that others will you know, rely on in the future. Um, the other interesting thing to note about the, the Murphy decision is the dissenting opinion, which is, uh, came from Justice Ginsburg. Justice Ginsburg criticized the majority for taking what she called a wrecking ball to the statute, uh, basically uh, you know, finding that no aspect of the statute could be saved. Um, but she did not in any way criticize the constitutional commandeering analysis. Her and Justice Sotomayor really restricted their dissenting opinion to the severability analysis that the court had conducted. So, you know, one, Justice Ginsburg also had dissented in Prince. She's not thought to be a great believer in the anti-commandeering principle, but one might think that she might have her eye on other cases in the pipeline. And one such case is uh, now being litigated in Philadelphia, uh, and it's the Sanctuary Cities case. And the district judge there has held that the, that the federal law requiring uh, state officials to cooperate with federal uh, immigration officials violates uh, the anti-commandeering principle. So perhaps she's looking ahead to future applications of the anti-commandeering principle. Uh, the next case I wanted to talk about was Ohio versus American Express. This is a, an antitrust case. It's uh, perhaps one of the most an, an, you know, important antitrust cases in the last 10 years. Uh, 
it is an application of the, the what's called the rule of reason uh, to what the court called two-sided platforms. So the first thing you need to understand about the American Express case is what is a two-sided platform. And a two-sided platform is one that offers different products or services to two different groups but who both depend on that platform to intermediate between them. So American Express is a credit card company and it has on the one hand merchants and on the other hand cardholders. So it has two sets of customers and it offers different services to each but it does so simultaneously whenever we slide our card into a machine to engage in a credit card transaction. At that moment in time, it is providing one set of services to the merchant and a different set of services to the cardholder. And the Supreme Court in a 5-4 decision here holds that in these two-sided platforms, you generally should analyze it as a single market. And this is quite important because if you do any kind of rule of reason litigation, much turns on the definition of the market. And it, here, if you analyze it as a single market, the Supreme Court found that there was no anti-competitive effect on the market as a whole. Whereas if you focus narrowly just on the merchant side, the, the American Express's anti-steering rule that was at issue in the litigation, you know, you, you, it could have been argued, and it, indeed it was found by the district court, that that anti-steering rule raised prices anti-competitively on the merchant side. But if you analyze the market as a whole, meaning both the merchant side and the, uh, the cardholder side, what the Supreme Court said is that actually there is no anti-competitive effect because the, what, what you see as price increases on the merchant side is really necessary to keep the cardholders and pay extra benefits in the form of airline miles and membership reward points and fancy travel benefits to the car American Express card holders and thereby keep them in the American Express network. And if you diminished the benefits to the card holders, there would be fewer card holders and then there would be fewer merchants that took the, uh, the American Express card and you would have what the Supreme Court called a feedback loop of declining demand. Um, so this, I think, is a pretty significant antitrust case, not so much for what it says about credit card networks, which is interesting as far as it goes, but really because so much of our new digital economy is comprised of these two-sided platforms. Think about Uber. Uber connects drivers to people who want rides. Airbnb connects homeowners to people who want homes to stay in eBay and Amazon collect merchants and consumers. All of these companies and many, many, many more will be subject to this new analysis applicable to two-sided platforms and they will be analyzed as a single market and they'll be able to stave off antitrust, uh, well, they'll be able to defend antitrust allegations in part on the basis that whatever cost increases are being applied on one side of here are also are creating benefits applicable to the other side and that if you don't let us do that it's going to basically decrease the demand on the other side and thereby uh, destroy the business um, so that's american express the uh, next two cases i'll just handle together uh, are oil states and Western Geco, which are the two, what I think are the most significant patent cases of the term. Both of these opinions are by Justice Thomas. Um, oil states is a, is the, was the Article III constitutional challenge to the inter, inter partes review regime that had been set up by the American Invents Act. And Western Geco uh, involved a, uh, the availability of lost profits damages to, uh, to lost profits damages based on sales that would have occurred abroad. So if, you, if your patent has been infringed, you are going to show that I lost sales and thereby lost profits. 
could I obtain damages and lost profits damages, not only for my, the sales I lost in the United States, but also the sales I lost abroad. Um, the Supreme Court in oil states upholds uh, the IPR, inter partes review regime against the, uh, the constitutional challenge. And in Western GECO, uh, affirms the availability of lost profits damages based on foreign sales. And taken together, I think these two cases show how much the, the, the threat of uh, the, the threat or the presence or absence of the threat of patent trolls can really influence the outcome of patent cases at the court. So in oil states, technology companies weighed in you know, very strongly to defend this inter partes review regime as vital and necessary to keep, to weed out, weed out uh, bad patents that had been acquired by patent trolls that were, whose only business model was litigation and were creating no value. Um, but patent trolls, because they don't make anything, or patent assertion entities, because they don't make anything other than lawsuits, uh, really don't have the, ab the ability to recover lost profits damages. Lost profits damages can be obtained only by somebody who actually makes things and sells them in the market. And you know, with, in Western GECO, with no patent trolls lurking under the bridge, the Supreme Court found you know, seven to two that the Federal Circuit actually had been, you know, had been uh, too miserly in, in the damages that it, it was awarding to patent holders, which was really a first for uh, the Supreme Court in recent years. Um, so I think you know, th these two cases really do show that, uh, that the Supreme Court remains quite concerned about uh, the, what I think is the patent troll problem. Um, but also uh, is willing to uh, have robust enforcement of patent rights for plaintiffs that are actually adding value in our free enterprise system. Um, the last case I'm going to uh, mention, and perhaps the uh, most significant of all, is uh, for the free enterprise system is. Nifla versus Becerra, who is the Attorney General of California. This is another opinion by Justice Thomas. Um, this is a case that involved a California state law that required uh, certain disclosures to be made by, um, by pregnancy crisis centers, which are uh, centers that, uh, that basically or, or counsel against abortion and provide alternatives to uh, pregnant person, pregnant women in in you know often desperate circumstances, and provides them alternatives that uh, often help them uh, have the have the baby rather than um, seek an abortion. And California enacted a law that required uh, these pregnancy crisis centers, and really only these pregnancy crisis centers, to make certain uh, disclosures. And it, the, the text of the statute actually prescribes the disclosures and, and you know, down to the letter. And it required, in some cases, for these disclosures to be made in up to 13 different languages uh, in Los Angeles County. Uh, so it, it was a rather onerous uh, burden that had been placed on these pregnancy crisis centers and them alone. Um, that suggested to many that this, uh, this state law could be struck down on the ground that it was uh, engaging in viewpoint discrimination. And indeed, four justices uh, of the Supreme Court, in a concurring opinion, basically says that this statute was viewpoint discriminatory. And that would have been an easy off-ramp for the, for the court to take. Um, the, the, the way that the statute had been gerrymandered in terms of its application made obvious and transparent that it was designed to burden the speech of these pregnancy crisis centers. Um, but the Supreme Court, the, the majority here, the majority opinion, again, authored by Justice Thomas, really takes a, takes a different uh, tack and one that is much more, I think, beneficial to free enterprise, um, which is that it rejected the idea that the Ninth Circuit had, uh, 
had endorsed, which is uh, that professional speech was subject to a lower level of First Amendment protection than speech generally. And Justice Thomas re uh, flatly rejects that proposition, saying that there is no, this, the Supreme Court has never said that professional speech, that that would be speech from any kind of professional to a client or customer, uh, is subject to a different level of scrutiny than any other form of speech. Um, and the Supreme Court then further discussed at great, uh, at some length, one of its earlier precedents, a case called Zouderer. And Zouderer was a case uh, that involved a regulation that uh, had been imposed on, a state regulation imposed on lawyers that required lawyers to make a disclosure uh, that if they were engaging in a, in a contingent fee transaction to make a disclosure that the client might be responsible for certain fees and costs. Um, the Supreme Court really puts tight limits on Zouderer. Um, Zouderer in, in the years since it was issued by the Supreme Court has uh, justified a great many uh, forms of disclosure and, and many, many disclosures, particularly in the state of California, uh, have been uh, justified on the grounds that they, that they are permitted under Zouderer. And you think of the, uh, the, disclosure, the Proposition 65 disclosures in California, which say, you know, this cup of coffee contains chemicals that the state of California has determined cause cancer. There's a, there's a cert petition pending that my partner Helgi Walker uh, wrote, which uh, is for CTIA, the Wireless Association, against the city of Berkeley. And the city of Berkeley requires cell phone uh, you know, sellers in the city to post a, uh, a disclosure that says that uh, if you leave your cell phone on in your pocket, you may be receiving more than the uh, than the, uh, the RF transmission uh, amounts that, that the FCC uh, recommends. Um, these kind of disclosures, uh, you know, tend to, you, are misleading, they create a needless fear, they're not very informative, um, but nevertheless, they, the, the states have, uh, they seem to be kind of populating and, and, and popping up all over the place. Uh, all based on this Zouderer decision. And the Supreme Court in NIFLA really tightly confines Zouderer. It says, if you are going to proceed under Zouderer first, it has to be factual, non-controversial information related to the services that the business provides. Um, it suggests it also has, it is limited to advertising that that business engages in. But then maybe most importantly of all, the Supreme Court says, that this is subject to, uh, even under Zouderer, even if you are compelling a business to put out this factual, non-controversial information, uh, you are still, it still is subject to intermediate scrutiny, which means there has to be a real harm that the state is trying to address, not a hypothetical harm, a real harm, and it has to be narrowly tailored, and the, the, the disclosure the compelled speech has to be na narrowly tailored to that harm, and there can't be less burdensome alternatives, such as a public education campaign by the state. Um, I think you know, ri rigorous application of NIFLA in the lower courts will um, put a stop to many of these uh, disclosure requirements that are now uh, being uh, contemplated. Um, I think that's just about 20 minutes, so I'll uh, turn it over to questions. Thanks to everyone. If, again, if you're online, um, if you maximize the screen to, to view the presentations, you've got to minimize it back down again to be able to access the Q&A uh, template. But please do give us questions if you have questions. Um, Mike, I guess first I uh, want to see if you had any thoughts on either of your other two speakers' uh, uh, comments or elaborate on anything that, that they had said before we go into full blown long questions. Oh, not really. Just is this one? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, other than to say, I was happy with the SGs four for four on the switch. Every time they switched, they got on the right side from the wrong side, and uh, so that was very good. And. Uh, 
Uh, I can't emphasize enough, I guess, what we just said about NIFLA, which I think is really going to endanger a lot of these paternalistic uh, warnings for no reason, which are really thinly veiled attempt by state governments to go after products that they don't particularly like. But they can't argue that the way they've been peddled has been deceptive in any way, or they can't substantiate the harms. Uh, so I think this will lead to a lot of fruitful litigation by uh, commercial entities that have been forced to put up disclosures that are not tailored to uh, remedying any perceived uh, misstatement by the people selling the product or any really tangible harm. Uh, so I think out of all the cases they discussed, all of which are important, I think NIFLA is probably going to be the one that's going to lead to the most fruitful lower court litigation. Well, so you, your colleagues at Latham & Watkins have the American Beverage Association case where this might have an impact. Could you talk a little bit about how it might influence that outcome? Uh, a little bit, probably not, not, not terribly much. much. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, just to give an update on, on that case, so that case involves, um, you know, sugary sweetened beverages in, in California. There's a law that requires, um, in San Francisco, there's an ordinance that requires uh, advertisements, uh, billboards and the like for those beverages to have a health warning uh, on it saying that it contributes to obesity, diabetes, and, and tooth decay. And so there was a challenge brought uh, in district court there uh, seeking a preliminary injunction under the First Amendment. The district court denied the preliminary injunction. It went up on appeal on a Ninth Circuit panel uh, reverse and said that that you know it was likely to succeed on, on showing that it was in violation um, of the First Amendment. The uh, San Francisco, the city of San Francisco, filed a petition for rehearing on Bonk that was granted, uh, and the court initially you know granted rehearing on Bonk, um, did not ask for additional briefing, and basically said it was going to decide the case on the briefs without any additional argument. Uh, shortly thereafter, it decided it was going to hold the case for the Supreme Court's decision in NIFLA. Uh, and, and yesterday, the court um, scheduled oral argument before the en banc court uh, in September, September 20, 25th, uh, but didn't again request any additional uh, briefing. And so, you know, th there is no question that, that NIFLA is going to have an impact and should have an impact uh, on the case. And, and, you know, whether it's in briefing or just that argument before the court, uh, I think there'll be different interpretations um, of NIFLA, but the the focus on Zouderer, and you know, it was sort of necessary for the court, I think, to weigh in on Zouderer because it had started going so far afield um, from where from what Zouderer was, the actual facts of Zouderer. One of the arguments made in in uh, the the CDIA case as well uh, as this case that the lower courts haven't really given much attention to. Um, is whether, as a threshold matter, Zatterer should apply outside the area of deceptive and misleading speech, which is what the facts of Zatterer actually were. Um, and so that, you know, that's one issue lurking in the background that, that I have to read that again. I'm not sure if it directly speaks to, but, but certainly um, other contours of Zatterer are directly at issue, and how, if you're even within the confines of Zatterer, how it applies um, will have a significant impact on that in other cases. Thank you for the update on that. Uh, any questions from our audience? Uh, Richard Samp, I'd like to ask any of the panelists if they have any uh, thoughts about the future of uh, qualified immunity in the Supreme Court. Um, certainly over the years it has been uh, well protected by the Supreme Court, but Justice Thomas in particular seems to suggest it really shouldn't exist anymore. And uh, in the decision last year in Ziegler where perhaps the most obvious uh, protection for senior government officials would have been to give them qualified immunity, the court pointedly ignored that and, and uh, found other grounds for, for protecting the, the, uh, 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 the government officials. I'm wondering if, the, if anybody sees any potential that the court will, perhaps on an originalist grounds, cut back on qualified immunity in the future. Any thoughts? Uh, I'll wade in in my normally uninformed, intuitive way. Uh, <laughs> Look, I, I think, yes, it, the, to belabor the obvious, if Justice Thomas takes a principled original stand that will align with what we're calling the four liberal justices' views in terms of, for example, making police officers or other government officials liable where qualified immunity has been a defense, then it's quite easy to envision where 
Justice Thomas's view that there is no qualified immunity and the liberal justice's view that qualified immunity is nonetheless satisfied here could lead to a result which would subject uh, civil servants and other people interacting with the public to more liability than they've certainly exposed in the past. Um, it's going to be a little difficult to envision where that scenario happens because if you adhere to their qualified immunity uh, jurisprudence and don't reject it out of hand as Justice Thomas has done, then you've got to do a lot of either manipulation of what, as you know, Rich, it's got to be a clearly established constitutional principle and you've got to manipulate that in a lot of ways. But I could see it arising in, for example, just off the top of my head, uh, Governor Christie in another case was involved in this whole Bridgegate scandal, right? And the notion was that the people who had uh, made the traffic worse at the George Washington Bridge had violated some clearly established constitutional right, which in this case they claimed was intrastate travel. Well, anybody who's ever lived in New Jersey, the notion that I have a right not to be in a traffic jam within New Jersey is counterintuitive. In any event, I could see a case like that where you have some, I'll again call them liberal judges, want to hold these people liable, but there's really not a clearly established rule where you could cobble together uh, a five-person majority that would subject them to liability. No. One thought, and I, I haven't looked to see what the, the stats are this term, so I'll also say this in a somewhat uninformed manner, but you know, one impact it could have is, is with respect to summary reversals. The, the court, you know, as a general matter, says it doesn't do error correction, but sort of one exception to that rule oftentimes is uh, each term there are usually a handful of qualified immunity cases that uh, it, it takes and reverses summarily, saying that the lower court got, got it wrong. These are cases that, that for the most part, wouldn't warrant plenary review. It's not something they would have argued uh, on the merits, and to the extent uh, the votes maybe aren't there anymore, or there's concern about the votes not being there, I think the first trend we might see, uh, if it's headed in that direction, is, is fewer qualified immunity cases, either you know in a summary basis or, or um, after argument. So I, I think I would first sort of watch the trend on, on summary reversals in, in the qualified immunity area to see if, if that's shifting a bit in, in light of Justice Thomas's opinion. Any other questions? Ken Joe's Supreme Court yearbook, Mike kind of sort of implied that the overall docket of business cases is thin, and I wonder if the other two panelists uh, agree with that, and to the extent whether it's thin or thick, uh, is this court um, generally sympathetic to business interests or not, or, or not? If I can, I'd like to hear from both of them. Just to clarify, I think uh, they're very reluctant to get involved if state courts have gone after businesses, and they're generally reluctant to go after if there's absent a split. But I'd like everybody's views on they did sort of reach out for this Apple case, and I think you can argue that sometimes they are reaching out for cases if it involves an unresolved federal law issue, either in the patent area or others. Uh, patent law, they do seem to do a fair amount of error correction, mainly because the federal circuit was designed to eliminate all those problems, and the federal circuit tends to issue fractured and coherent opinions, so the Supreme Court has sort of stepped into the void. But with that caveat, I'll, I'll shut up. Well, I guess my, my sense is that the, the court obviously is taking less cases at, at, at a global level. I think this year is 63 cases for argument. So that's, you know, that, that's lower, as low as it's been uh, in recent years. And, you know, certainly many, many less than it took, you know, say 20 years ago um, when maybe they took, you know, 50% more. Uh, so. Certainly, I think fewer business cases are being taken because of that. Um, just less cases are being taken, generally speaking. Um, you know, I don't know that the, that, that the court is um, more sympathetic to, to business as such than as opposed to the arguments that businesses tend to be advancing. Um, you know, the, you the ones that jump out most readily are the arbitration cases and the class action cases. And, you know, th those are uh, 
issues where I think there's a solid, you know, majority uh, and a coherent majority that has um, ruled in favor of uh, more arbitration and, you know, tighter restrict, tighter regulation of class actions. Um, and it happens to be businesses uh, that are um, push, pushing those arguments. So in that sense, I, I think certainly, and in that area, they are sympathetic. Just, just to footnote that point, I really do think it is a subject matter specific about whether or not they're going to take the cases and, and which way they're going to rule. For example, arbitration, again, Justice Thomas, I don't believe thinks the FAA, the Federal Arbitration Plan, applies to state courts overriding arbitration agreement. So you could see an egregious decision by a state court where you wouldn't take that case, you'd wait for it to arrive in a, in a federal court. Similarly, I think one of the, the issues that a lot of businesses are facing, we've been talking about California a lot, where they're imposing all these kinds of onerous restrictions which under at least the typical or at least the muscular view of the Dormant Commerce Clause, you could go after these California efforts to reach beyond its borders and regulate businesses outside. But again, since Justice Thomas and now apparently Justice Gorsuch doesn't really think there's much to the Dormant Commerce Clause, uh, the other, quote, conservatives on the court might not take the case because they don't think they would be doing the kind of uh, anti-business error correction that we're talking about. I, I agree with all of that. I admit to, when I say that, I admit to being a bit distracted. Uh, a news just broke that Justice Kennedy announced his retirement. Uh, and I just caught that in the middle of our, our conversation. So I wanted to take a moment so that you know everyone in the audience knew that as well, if you don't have your phones out. Um, and, uh, and that distracted me from the conversation we were, we were having. No, I really uh, about like to keep talking about NIFLA. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's really very unimportant news. I, I, I can't believe you interrupted our discussion. I, know. I, I thought oh. about doing it a minute or two earlier, <laughs> yeah, 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 but, yeah, exactly. uh, but it seemed like the right moment. Oh, that's unbelievable. Yeah. Anyway, I'm not entirely unhappy. <laughs> I'm unhappy 50%. Uh, you know, I'm available, but uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, if you want a nine-month confirmation hearing, I'm sure uh, <laughs> I'm sure we can go there. Yeah. Everybody on the list is, you know, that they published is quite good. So, anyway. so I'll give you guys yeah. the opportunity to comment briefly yeah. on Justice Kennedy's retirement. We could spend another half an hour talking about that, I'm sure, but. We're already a little bit over our time. All right, we are over, and of course, it's an enormous subject, and everybody in this room knows. I, I don't know what your guys' tea leave reading was. It was, I, you did sort of have the sense they were sort of putting on hold some decisions because, for example, gerrymandering being the most obvious that maybe Justice Kennedy hadn't come to closure on it. Um, and uh, he was issuing these opinions, which you could almost sort of say, these are, I'm telling, you know, my successors, he, he went out of his way to suggest that Chevron might not be an important thing. And, uh, so there was sort of this in instinct that perhaps he was leaving. Uh, the effect on the court, I think, is dramatically obvious. If they go with the true originalist, then you won't see, A, you'll see fewer narrower opinions of the kind we were deciding because they won't, they'll either decide or not decide, say, the Masterpiece Kate case or the gerrymandering case. They won't come up with narrow opinions. And then I think we all know in the issue of same-sex marriage, some other issues involving gay rights, some affirmative action issues, and those sorts of things where Justice Kennedy has been the swing vote going in different directions, um, you might see the court uh, tilt uh, relatively uh, cognizably to the right, not in a huge way. And then I also think the other dynamic is Chief Justice Roberts might be the person who is viewed by the court and by the public as sort of the person who's now in, quote, the middle of the court and will be the uh, uh, outcome determinative factor. And that's why your point about him being in the majority so often this year is pretty interesting. But you know, you know. Yeah, I think, I think it puts the end of the year statistics in a, in a very different light, both <laughs> with respect to the chief, um, but also that, that Justice Kennedy's last year in the court is one in which he you know, was not so middle of the road. Uh, and, and, you know, may have still been the swing, but swung one way consistently uh, in, in, in the major cases. And so, um, I, you know, I feel like every year there's been speculation about him retiring, and I, I stopped believing it. Um, but, you know, it was going to happen one year or another. So here we are.
Well, I, I think it, you know, if the, if one of the themes, Mike, of, of the year was the Supreme Court punting on different issues, like partisan gerrymandering, like masterpiece cake, you know, the, the news of Justice Kennedy's retirement kind of maybe helps explain that. Yeah. Right? If Justice Kennedy thought that, well, I can have this partisan gerrymandering ruling that I've been contemplating since, you know, Vieth, um, and but it could be erased the next year, you know, we shouldn't do that. That's not good for the court. And so he, in the absence of us, in the absence of six votes for for a rule against partisan gerrymandering, he wasn't going to go there. And maybe you have the same thing playing in which way, I'm not sure, uh, uh, in the Masterpiece Cake case. Um, it's, uh, it's obviously going to make for a very interesting summer here in <laughs> Washington. <Yes>. Um, <laughs> holy cow. Yeah. Well, the end of the term reviews will be <laughs> very different in character. Right. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately, we caught it a little bit too early in the, the, the well, we also of the issue. But we caught it right figured on. out the only thing that's going to keep Janice off everybody's front pages tomorrow. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's good. Well, much like the NFL has figured out a way to be constantly in the news, even when they're not in session, the Supreme Court has now found a way to figure out how to stay in the news over the summer when they're out of session. So it'll keep us all on our toes. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. And we'll stay tuned. Thank you. Jeez. Uh, <laughs>